Welcome to Andrew Womack Recorded Live, a weekly podcast featuring Andrew's latest live teaching sessions, along with his other classic teachings through the years. And now, here's Andrew. Praise God. You know, I have been really encouraged and blessed. This has been good for me. It's been awesome. And you know, even though we're apart, I just got a thing, you know, I don't know, there's over a thousand people watching right now. We've had, I think yesterday, over 2,600 people that were watching at any one time. And um, even though we can't see you, you know, the scripture says, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says, I'm not with you in body, but I'm with you in spirit, joying and beholding your order. And there is a spiritual connection because we aren't just like normal people. We are all brothers and sisters in the Lord. The Holy Spirit indwells each one of us. And there is a union and there is a fellowship that takes place even when you can't see a person. You know, when I want to teach something and I just want to be as detailed as I can be and not get off on my rabbit trails and, and do things, I will sit in front of a television set and record something. Because if I'm teaching to the television or if I'm teaching to a live audience, did you know I can't teach it the way that I have it kind of set in my mind. I will be interacting with the people that I'm ministering to and I'm responding and I can tell, I don't know how to describe this, but I can tell if the people are getting what I'm saying, if I need to stay here for a while and explain it more. And it's the Holy Spirit and it's interaction between me and people. So uh, when I just want to do something and be as detailed and cover every detail that I've got, I don't want people watching because I will react to you whether you're watching it live through a set or not. So my point is, I believe that there has been a connection and I believe that God has touched some of you just as we gave these words tonight. I believe that God has been touching people's lives and if you'll receive it, it'll change you. Hebrews chapter four, verse two says that the word preached unto them, talking about the children of Israel that came out of the land of Egypt, the word preached unto them did uh, as well as unto us, but it didn't profit them not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. You have to believe, you have to receive. And I'm telling you, God has been touching some people's lives and God has spoken to you. And I want to encourage you to do what God's saying to you. You know, Wendell ministry, actually every person who's ministered has been talking about hearing the voice of God and responding but Wendell just made it really clear today about when he quoted Mary saying, whatsoever he says unto you, do it. So that's really as simple as it is. It takes all the pressure off of you. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. You don't have to be the sharpest knife in the drawer. All you got to do is just stay in fellowship with the Lord and learn to hear his voice. And if you'll do what God tells you to do, he'll make you look good. Case in point right here. <laughs> Amen. I tell you what, if I've, I've said it all, but if I was God, I wouldn't have chosen me. I was the least likely to succeed. And yet I just came to know God. I've done what he's told me and God has blessed me. It's just awesome what he's done. So what I want to share with you tonight is how do you hear God's voice? And I've got an entire series on this. Actually, this is something that is got so many layers to it that there's no way I could even cover the whole subject if I taught on it for weeks, but certainly not in one night. I'm just going to have to focus on a few things. But let me say that it's, it's not one dimensional. It's a process. And I'm just going to make this point quickly and say it because I want to move on to some other things. But I believe that really the, the beginning place of hearing the voice of God, I guess you could say the beginning is you need to be born again. And then you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. When I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, man, I mean, it's like God just started shouting at me. Uh, before that time, I wasn't sure that I'd heard God, but I started hearing the voice of God. And did you know the number one way that he was speaking to me was through the word? I have read the word probably every day of my life since I was a little kid. I remember one, when my father brought me home one time from a rodeo and I fell asleep in the car and he picked me up and brought me in and put me in the bed. It's probably midnight when we got home and I was already asleep, but I hadn't read my daily Bible readings is what we called it in the Baptist church. And I couldn't go to bed. I woke up from a dead sleep and went ahead and read my daily Bible readings. I mean, I don't think that there was a day in my life that I didn't do that. 
I just, it was just ingrained in me. But when I received the Holy Spirit, when I read the word, God spoke to me. I remember one time I, I was in uh, college, my first year of college, when I had a, an experience and received the Holy Spirit. And I remember being in the Baptist Student Union building and we would go into these little prayer uh, cubicles that they had. Most of the guys and girls would go in there and make out what they would do in the Baptist <laughs> Student Union. But anyway, we would go in there and actually pray and read the Bible. And I remember being in there and I mean, I just flopped the Bible open any place and God just spoke things to me. It was like I couldn't open the Bible without God showing me something that applied directly to me. And I could spend all of this night and many other nights on this, but let me just say that if you don't believe the revealed Word of God, the written Word of God, and if you don't meditate in it and let God speak to you through the wit written Word of God, you are really going to hinder hearing God's voice in specific things that aren't written down in the Word of God. Why would God show you something specific if you won't receive the general revelation that He's given? Do you know, just this week I was uh, listening to the radio as I drove in and they were interviewing somebody about, uh, you know, they're opening up some of the businesses now and things like this and a person was just uh, very upset saying this is going to cause millions of people to die and uh, the person interviewing him said well these people are saying that you know all of the uh, predictions have been wrong time and time again and they don't think it's as severe and a lot of people have already had the virus and have an immunity to it and they were giving all of these other things and he says anybody who believes that believes that Noah had an ark and that that stuff was real. He says, you're stupid. And when he said that, I said, I believe that. Amen. <laughs> I believe that with all of my heart. And he said, anybody who believes that is absolutely stupid. Now I can tell you that person is not going to hear the voice of God clearly because he doesn't even believe the revealed word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. And it takes faith for you to hear the voice of God. And if you don't believe that this is the Word of God, and if you are not studying this, and then when you do study it, and God says that, you know, like, let not your heart be troubled. And you know He says that, but you don't care. You're going to go by what you feel anyway. And you don't care what the Word says. Sad to say, most people, even most Christians, do not let the Bible get in the way of what they believe. If you don't honor the written Word of God, and if you aren't doing what you know to do, clearly know to do in the written Word of God, you aren't going to clearly hear any special instructions of God. That's a huge statement. And like I said, I could spend days or weeks on this. So if you're watching this, I'm not going to elaborate on this much more, but if you are watching this, you need to start doing what you know in the Word of God already. I don't believe God. You know, it's like God's not going to give you step one through ten and give you all these things if you aren't even doing step number one. That just makes you more accountable. Why would God heap more things upon you when you aren't even doing the things that it's clear that you're supposed to do. So you, you need to do what the Word of God says. You need to honor this Word. And none of us understand everything, but you need to operate in what you do know. You need to study the Word and you need to act on the written Word of God. But if you are doing that, and if you truly have a heart to obey, and if you've made the commitment that, God, I'm going to do whatever you tell me to do, and I think that that's important that you make that kind of decision because, you know, personally, when I minister to people, I know sometimes that I'm telling people that they don't want to do. And Jesus said not to cast your pearls before the swine. If the Lord knows that you're just going to do your own thing and only obey him if that just fits into your plans, but you're trying to get God to bless your plans and you aren't committed to him, well, then, in a sense, again, I'm not saying this in a negative way, but it's like you don't value the things of God. God's not going to show you these things if he knows that you're just going to reject it. That's really important. 
So you have to, first of all, believe the written word of God. You have to, be a, you have to make a commitment that, Father, whatever you say unto me, I will do it. But here's what I wanted to focus on tonight is that God will speak specific things to you, things that aren't clearly revealed in the Word of God. Now, let me put this little parenthetical phrase in here before we go any further, that nothing that God says to you specifically, personally about an individual situation will ever violate the Word of God. Like, for instance, some of you are thinking, oh, God, I hate this woman I'm married to. Could I please go get another one? Uh, no. God is not going to tell you that adultery is okay and that it's all right to go out and indulge your flesh. It will, God will never say anything specifically to you that violates the written Word of God. The inspired Word of God that is recorded right here will not contradict the spoken Word of God directly to you. It'll never contradict. And again, this is a reason that if you don't know this word, you aren't going to be able to rightly divide whether it's a true word from God or not. I believe it was Pastor Greg that used the verse out of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, that says the word of God is quick. That means alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Your soul is where your emotions, your intellect, your feeling is. Your spirit is where the born again part of you is, the part that has the mind of Christ and knows all things and has this wisdom that Pastor Greg was talking about. And the Word of God is the only thing that can divide between what is coming from the born again part of you, that spirit part, and the soulish part, just your own will and your own emotions. So if you don't know the Word of God, it's going to be hard for you to discern, was this just my desire or was this God that put this desire in my heart? So again, it goes back to the Word of God. The more you know of the Word of God, the more you study the Word of God, the more you're going to hear the voice of God. They are linked. But just for discussion point, I want to turn over to Psalms chapter 37 and share these verses with you. And these are some things that God has taught me that I have used. I use them constantly and uh, it's how God has spoken to me about starting this school, about building these buildings, about being on television, about giving our materials away, and on and on I could go. There are thousands of things that God has spoken to me that this is how I heard His voice. So in Psalms chapter 37, verse 1, it says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb, herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land and verily thou shalt be fed. And in verse 4 it says, Delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of thine heart. This does not mean that if you delight yourself in the Lord, he'll just give you whatever you want because you may want a different mate and that's not God's will. You may covet something and the Bible specifically says that covetousness is idolatry. Colossians chapter three, verse five. And it's one of the 10 commandments that you shall not covet your neighbor's uh, you know, animals, his wife, his possessions. It's one of the Ten Commandments. And you might be coveting and wanting what you see everybody else has. This isn't saying that God is going to fulfill all of your lust and give you anything that you want. But this is saying that when you delight yourself in the Lord, God will put his desires in your heart. That is awesome. That is really profound right there. And a lot of people don't understand this. You know, the church that I was raised in, the Baptist church, they didn't teach who you were in Christ. They didn't teach that you had a part of you that was born again and that as Jesus is, so are you in this world, 1 John 4, 17. They didn't teach that you had the mind of Christ. Again, as Pastor Greg was teaching, that you already have wisdom and that you just have to draw it out. They didn't teach those things. They taught that we were an old sinner saved by grace. They taught that we were forgiven, but it wouldn't become a reality until we went to heaven. And in this life, you are an old sinner. You are a scumbag and that uh, there isn't any good thing in you. 
And I remember when the Lord first told me that I was the righteousness of God. I got it by revelation. I saw it in the word. And I literally went and looked in a mirror and looked myself eyeball to eyeball. And I said, you are the righteousness of God. And I honestly felt like God was going to strike me dead because that was against everything I'd ever been taught. And it took me a long time to really embrace it to where I could say about myself what God said. So my point is that in the Baptist church, they said, here's how you discern whether you're hearing the voice of God. You take whatever you want to do and do the exact opposite, and that's God. And did you know that that's true if you are a scumbag? If you are an old sinner saved by grace, and if everything about you is wrong, it is true that this carnal nature, our flesh part, does not desire the things of God. And if you don't acknowledge that there's a born again part of you, and you think that salvation doesn't really take place until you go to heaven, well, then that would be accurate because the Bible says that the flesh is enmity against the Spirit of God. They are not subject to each other. They can't be. And so that would be true. But because we are born again, there is a part of you that is born again. In a, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, you have the mind of Christ. It's not out there somewhere. You have it. It's in your born again spirit. 1 John 2, 20 says that you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. That's not true in your soul, but it's true in your spirit. And the Word of God will divide between what is coming out of your soul and what's out of your spirit. It says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 10, to put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Your new man, this spirit part of you, has the mind of Christ. It knows all things. And so when you delight yourself in the Lord then God puts his desires in your heart and you can have godly desires. And this is something that was hard for me at first, but I began to realize that it was God putting these desires in my heart. It wasn't just me. Man, I'm trying to say a lot of things here and I've got a lot of things I'd love to say, but let me... Let me just say this. I'm not going to dwell here either. But did you know God doesn't speak to you from the outside in? Now, he can do that. There's occasions where he's done that. When he first spoke to Paul, he knocked him off of his horse, you know, and he saw a blinding light and he heard an audible voice. God can speak that way. But most of the time he speaks to us in this still small voice. He speaks to us through our spirit. And when he speaks to us, he doesn't say, I want you to go do this. What he does, he just communicates his heart to you and your born again spirit who is one with him. 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says, if you are born again, you are one spirit with him. And your spirit just picks up on what's in his heart. Your heart picks up on what's in his heart. And all of a sudden, if he wants you to go there, He doesn't say, I want you to go there. You will think, I want to go there. All you have to do is decide, is that your flesh or was it your spirit that wanted to do this? And again, I could go into great detail on this, but the first part of this verse, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. So if you can truly say that God, I am delighting in you, I'm putting you first in my life. I'll do anything you want me to do. And if you can truly say that, and the scripture says the heart knows its own bitterness, you know whether or not you are genuine in your commitment that God, I'll go anywhere, I'll do anything. And if you can truly say that, then you know what? You trust these desires. And again, you check it by the word and make sure that you aren't wanting to go do something that would directly violate the word. Let me give you an example of this, that when I first learned this, I was in my, I had just had this encounter with the Lord where God revealed himself to me. I was in my first year of um, college and I was, it was in March the 23rd. So it was towards the end of the first year. And man, when I fell in love with the Lord, I just, I was delighting myself in the Lord. And I was so excited about the Lord that I didn't desire anything else. I didn't even eat 
for four and a half months except just grabbing something to walk by. I couldn't sit down and eat because, man, I could be reading the Bible or praying. And I know that sounds weird. That sounds fanatical, and it was, but I didn't eat. I didn't sit down and eat a meal for four and a half months. I didn't ever sleep more than an hour at a time for four and a half months. I literally was so tired that one time I was walking out the door and I thought, I'm just going to rest against the door for a second. And I fell asleep and fell over. I mean, I could fall asleep standing up. But I was so excited about the Lord that I couldn't just go to bed and go to sleep when I could be talking to God. And I just was so turned on to the Lord that I lost my desire for anything. I had a horse that I had bought when I was in high school and I rode that horse every day of my life. If it was snowing, raining, or anything, and I was four and a half months later before I even remembered that horse. I didn't know if anybody had fed it, if it was still alive. I hadn't even thought about it. I just lost my desire for anything. And so, as a result, I just lost my desire to go to school. And I went to school every day. I was still single. I was living at home. My mother told me, you will go to school. And so I'd go to class, but I was so excited about the Lord. I'd get to talking to people about the Lord and the time it'd be to go to class. And I couldn't let them go to hell because it was time for me to go to class. So I'd keep talking to them. And by the time I got through witnessing to them, uh, that class would be half over. So I'd go talk to somebody else. And by the time the next class came up, I was talking to somebody new. And so anyway, for two months, I went to school, but I never made a single class because I, I was talking to people. And so after a while, I thought, why am I paying for going to school? I hate this. And I, man, I don't have the words to tell you how much I hated going to school. Prior to that time, I loved it. It was like I was finally out on my own and uh, I loved it. And I, I, I was having a great time. And all of a sudden, just all desire for going to college left me. And I could spend a lot of time on this, but I've, I just was so perplexed by this that finally I said, I'm going to quit school. And when I said that, man, in my Baptist church, it would have been easier if I would have got up and confessed that I had committed adultery. They might have forgiven me for that. But to say that you weren't going to school and to say that God told me not to go to school, I had the pastor come out and say, you can't be a Christian and say that. And I know some of you think I'm exaggerating, but ours was a high-brow Baptist church. We, we were in uh, Arlington, Texas, which was close to Fort Worth, Texas, where Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary was. And when we had the pastor gone, we would have the professors from the cemetery, I mean seminary, come over and teach. And I mean, you'd have to sit there with a, um, you know, a dictionary to follow them because they'd use these... $10 words and stuff. And it was, they were just all excited about all of this intellectual stuff. And you could not say that you were a Christian and say that God told you to quit school. My mother was a school teacher. My father was a school teacher. My brother, my sister, my aunts, and all but one uncle were school teachers. One of them was a professor at Berkeley. Education was everything. Teaching was everything. And so for me to say that God told me to quit school, I mean the feathers hit the fan. And people started telling me, you're of the devil. And I was relatively new hearing the voice of the Lord, and it bothered me. So I, I pulled back, and everybody was telling me, this isn't God. And so for a period of time, I, that's when I was going to, I would try and make it to class, but I could never get there because I was witnessing to people. And finally... Uh, I was with my friends one night and usually we would stay out until two or three o'clock in the morning studying the word and, you know, learning what the other one had been hearing from God and stuff. And it was about eight or nine o'clock at night and we read Romans chapter 14, verse 23, where it says, whosoever doubteth is damned if he eat because whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And it's the first time I'd ever remember reading that. And all of a sudden I realized that I was saying that God had told me to quit school. And yet I was still in school because of the criticism and the influence of other people upon me. And I saw that I'm in sin. I need to make a decision. Is God telling me to leave school or is he telling me to stay in? And, and if I don't do something in faith, 
then I'm in sin. And so that night, instead of staying out to two or three, I left at like eight o'clock. I went home and I told my friends, I said, I'm in sin. And I said, I'm, I'm wavering. It says in James chapter one, you know, whoever wavers is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. And I wasn't committed to any direction. I was doing things that other people were telling me to do. So anyway, I said, I'm going to go home and I'm going to be in faith by this time tomorrow. I will not be in sin tomorrow. So I went home and I began to say, God, I don't know what's right or wrong. I don't know if this is me or if it's you, but I hate going to school. And that's when the Lord showed me that he would give me the desires of my heart. And because I'd been delighting in him, this was God that put the desire in my heart to leave school. And you know, every one of you have experienced what I'm talking about. You may not have sat down and thought about it, but before you got born again, there were things that you liked to do that when you got born again, all of a sudden your desires changed. And it wasn't that you sat down and just uh, officially said, I'm not going to do these things anymore, but God just changes your heart. You know, Clay was talking about when he came and sat in my office, and I remember that. He did not <laughs> want to be there. His parents were friends of mine and partners and they, brought, they came to see me and they just happened to bring Clay with him. And Clay did not want to be there. His attitude was wearing all over him. You could see it. <laughs> and anyway, uh, but you know what? God changed his heart so that now Clay is so on fire and so excited about God. That wasn't Clay that did all of this. It was the influence of the Holy Spirit upon him because he started delighting himself in the Lord and God has changed Clay's heart. Every one of you experienced this. There's some of you that, man, you just couldn't wait to be drunk or high on dope all of the time and God's changed your heart. So I'm saying that this is what I was believing that God had told me to do, but everybody else who was supposed to be more mature in the Lord, including the pastor of the church, told me I was of the devil. And that this was the devil speaking to me. The devil would never tell me to quit school because not only would I, you know, not have the education that it was so important in my family, but I would probably lose my student deferment from the draft, which I did, and I would be drafted and sent to Vietnam. I also was getting $350 a month from the government as long as I stayed in school. It was uh, Social Security from my dad's death if I went to school. So I was going to lose money. I was going to lose the acceptance of family, friends, everybody, and I was probably going to be drafted and sent to Vietnam. It could kill me. So there was a lot of reasons that everybody was using to say that you've got to do this, but it's not what I felt in my heart. So when I went home and I began to start praying, the Lord showed me, he says, this is my desire. I put this desire in your heart. And I thought, but God, what about all of these other things? And let me share this other passage with you out of Colossians chapter 2. Or excuse me, where is this? I'll find it. It's either Colossians 2.15 or 3.15. 3.15. Colossians 3.15. It says um, in verse 15, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which ye are called, also called in one body, and be ye thankful. This said, you let the peace of God rule in your heart. And I thought, God, I, I don't know how to let the peace of God rule. And I was praying about this. I looked it up in a concordance. And the word rule there is the word that we get umpire from. And, you know, just like in baseball, the home plate umpire, they throw that ball and that umpire has to say ball or strike. He can't sit there and say, well, I'm not sure. Let's just play this one over. No, you've got to make a choice. And once you say that it's a ball or once you say it's a strike, you don't get to say, well, let's change it. Instead of being three and two, let's just make it, you know, uh, I don't know, we'll make them all balls and you've walked. You can't change it. You've got to let it rule. You've got to make a decision and be decisive about it. And right or wrong, you've got to go with it. And so as I was praying about this, the Lord said, that's what you've got to do. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. Make a decision. You've got to make a decision tonight because whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So I was praying and I said, oh God, how do I know which one is the right thing? And here's what the Lord spoke to me. And it may be different for you, but this is how I did it. This has been now, man, this is 
50 something years ago. And I just sat down and I said, Father, if I have to make a decision right now, which I had already decided I did, and if it was life and death, which it was, because if I quit school and got drafted and sent to Vietnam, I could, could die. And I said, if this was life and death, I've got to make the decision right now. And if I couldn't change, what would I do? And I just had this uh, image come to me. If somebody stuck a gun to my head and cocked it and said, you choose right now. And if you make the wrong decision, I'm going to kill you. (laughs) You know what? I said, well, I'm not sure. But if I had to let the peace dominate, if I had to let peace be the dominant thing, I had zero peace, zero, zilch, not a peace about staying in school. And I had more peace about quitting school. I didn't have total peace because I was immature and I I was letting what everybody else thought about me influence me, but I had more peace that direction. So I let the peace of God uh, rule in my heart. And so I made a decision right then and I told the Lord, I said, Father, to the best of my ability, this is what you're telling me to do. And it could cost me uh, every relationship I've got. I could be kicked out of the church, which I was. They voted me out of the church. I was kicked out of the church for that decision. I lost family members. Uh, I only had two friends left in the world. Uh, Two people supported me. Everybody else totally rejected me over it. But, you know, I said, this is what I feel the most peace about. So I made that decision, and praise God, I went to bed and went to sleep, slept good all night long. The next morning I got up, and here's another thing I want to share with you. Because I wasn't mature, because this was relatively new to me, rather than just making this decision... And then going out and burning all of my bridges and doing everything, I thought I'm going to test this a little bit. Now, this isn't the best way, but God knows where we are. And God is gracious unto us. He told a lot of people, according to your faith, so be it unto you. So I liken it to like getting in a boat. And you got to start moving. If you want that rudder to give you any direction, you've got to put some motion to your boat. Because if you sit still... And say, God, confirm my decision. He could flip the rudder 360 degrees and it'll never give any direction to that boat. But if you start moving, you don't have to be full steam ahead. Just start moving a little bit. Then God can start bearing witness and showing you whether you made the right or the wrong decision. So when I got up in the morning, I said, I'm going to go out and test this. And I went to the three people that I really respected One of them was the youth director that was there the night that I had this experience with the Lord and it just totally transformed my life. And he had, he had just told me in no uncertain terms, you are missing God. You are totally deceived by the devil. And I really respected him and he had been one of the hardest cases. There was another lady who was a uh, school teacher, the choir director in high school, and she was an outspoken Christian. And we had a great relationship because I was born again and I really respected her and I'd talked to her and she was a personal friend of my mother. My mother was a school teacher. She was a school teacher. And when I talked to this woman, she just jumped on me like a chicken on a June bug telling me that this is of the devil. She thought she was doing her friend, my mother, a service by this. And she just told me terrible things. And there was one other person. So anyway, that day I thought, I'm going to go talk to these people. So I went to the man who was a youth director and I braced myself and I said, I've made my decision and I believe God has told me to quit school and I am quitting. And I just braced. I didn't explain it. I just said it. And he looked at me and he says, you know what? I think that's the right thing. Just totally bowled me over. I was totally shocked. I was expecting the opposite. And then I went to this woman and she was the choir director And I walked into her and I said, Miss Ellis, I said, I've made my decision. And she says, what is it? And I said, I'm going to quit school. I believe God told me to quit school. And I was braced for her reaction. You know what she did? She started crying. And she says, I would give anything to be in your shoes and be 18 years old and have God speak to me and tell me what what his purpose for my life is. She says, 
I don't know how old she was. She was ancient to me at that time. She might've only been 50, but anyway, 50 or 60. And she says, I'm all this old and I'm doing these things and hoping that it's pleasing God, but I don't know what God's call and purpose for my life is. And she asked me to pray for her. And anyway, by the time I got through talking to those three people, I was absolutely convinced that I had heard from God and I made that decision. And you know, looking back at it, that it's just like that changed the whole direction of my life. I didn't realize what was happening at that time, but I was dyed in the wool Baptist. I had been raised Baptist. I knew all of those things. And God just plucked me out of that, put me in Vietnam. And for 13 months in Vietnam, I didn't do anything except sit there and read the Bible. And when I came out of Vietnam, I wasn't a Baptist. I didn't intend to change. I just got to reading the word and found out that, man, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, miracles were real. And it changed me. And looking back, I can see the wisdom of why God told me to do that and isolated me and put me in that situation and supernaturally protected me. It was one of the most important decisions I've ever made in my life. And it was as simple as I was delighting myself in the Lord and God put his desires in my heart. And then I let the peace of God rule in my heart. And I could give you hundreds of this is not an exaggeration. Hundreds of examples that this is exactly the way that I have heard the voice of God and have been led by God. I remember being in Pritchett, Colorado, a long story, but the, I had to come up with an elder. It was just a small church and the, and the two or three elders that they had were custom combiners and they were going to leave for six months on the wheat harvest. And they said, you need some elder here to help you. And so they chose this man. And this man is the first person that befriended me. He was a good friend. He was about 60 years old. I was probably 30 something at the time. And uh, there was no reason in the natural not to make this guy an elder. He looked good. I'd been over to his house. He was one of the ones that was the most receptive to everything I was teaching. But I just didn't feel good about it. I didn't have peace. And so I told him no. And they said, well, who else? And I didn't have anybody else in mind. And then the Days and weeks were dragging on and they were getting ready to leave. And they said, you've got to make a decision. And so out of duress and under pressure, I said, okay, we'll anoint this guy to be an elder. And uh, we did. They left on wheat harvest. And the very next Sunday, he stood up in front of the thing and he rebuked me and said that I was a liar. I was stealing money. I was committing adultery. I was doing drugs and alcohol. And he lied about me. And I mean, he became the devil personified and tried to take over the church. And as soon as it happened, I said, I knew I wasn't supposed to do that. I didn't have peace about it. And yet I let other people's opinion uh, compel me to do something and I said right then, I said, never again. I don't care if I'm wrong. I am, if until I get peace, I am going to let the peace of God rule in my heart. And I haven't done it perfectly, but this is one of the dominant things that I use to discern God's will. When I started on television, I just knew somehow that I was going to, I knew I was going to be on television because it was a way to reach large numbers of people. And I knew that's what God wanted me to do. But I also knew it was costly. I knew it could totally destroy our ministry. At that time, I'd been in ministry. That was in 1998, I guess, when the Lord spoke to me about going on television. And I got uh, turned on to the Lord in 68. So it had been 30 years and in 30 years, we had grown to this level and I was about to destroy the whole thing if this wasn't from God. So I began to pray about it and I basically made a decision that this is what I felt peace about. And it wasn't only peace, but prior to that time, I had people try and get me to go on television and even offer to pay the, for the television time. And I just did not want to do it. And when I finally prayed about it and felt like, I think this is the Lord, all of a sudden I got so excited that I, I lost a couple of nights sleep because I actually sat down and drew the set that I was going to have. I knew exactly what it was going to be like. I could see it. And I was so excited about it that I couldn't hardly stand it. And I decided to start on television. That's the way we started this Bible college. I had no desire for a Bible college. And then all of a sudden I was over in England, 1990. Uh, three, I think it was, on June the 22nd. And the Lord just spoke to me 
And all of a sudden, I had a desire for a Bible college. And I had never desired it before. And it was such a flip-flop. It was such a total transformation in the way I was thinking and feeling that I thought, is this God? And I prayed about it for a while. And you know what I do when I get one of these impressions and all of a sudden I get a desire and uh, about doing something? I go back to Psalms chapter 37, verse 4, and I say, am I delighting myself in the Lord? And I will fast and I'll pray and I'll turn off everything else and I'll get alone with God and just make sure that, man, my focus is on Him. I'm not being tempted or influenced by anything else. And if I get more in the presence of God and the desire continues and increases, then I believe that that's God giving me the desires of my heart. But if the more I get in focused on God and seek Him more, the desire diminishes, then I figure that that's just the flesh. And this is how I've started the Bible school. It's how I've started the uh, television ministry. It's how I, I got this property. It's how I built these buildings. It's all of these things. There are just thousands of things that God has spoken to me. And you can't find a scripture that says, thou shalt go on television, that you shall start a Bible college, that you will build this building instead of this building, that you buy this property. But I tell you what, this peace of God ruling in your heart is one of the simplest things. It says in uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, it says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Against such there is no law. Peace is one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Every person, you have peace on the inside of you. Now, you may not, you may be living so much in your emotions and living by what other people have to say to you that you aren't in tune with your heart. But in your heart, you have peace. You have love, joy, and peace. And I, I think that peace is one of the greatest fruit of the Spirit's Spirit because uh, there is no comparison to the peace that comes from God. It's a peace that passes understanding. Did you know there's a counterfeit to love? Hollywood has given us a wrong impression of love and people will say, oh, I love this person and you don't love them. You love yourself and see this is a way of satisfying your lust and desires. It's all selfish. And yet a lot of people think that's love and, and uh, joy. You know, the world has a counterfeit joy. They go out and party and get drunk and think that, man, this is great fun. That doesn't even compare with the true joy of the Holy Spirit. But did you know that the world doesn't really have much of a substitute for peace? People that don't know the Lord. Matter of fact, it says in Isaiah chapter, I think it's chapter 45, the last verse, there is no peace, saith my God to the wicked. There, there is nothing that compares with the peace of God. I've had peace when my son died. And yet I was totally at peace. I've had peace when people were spitting in my face, when people have done things to me. I've been kidnapped. I've been threatened to be killed. I've had things done and yet had a supernatural peace that was completely disconnected from any physical thing. There was no reason for it. It's a peace that passes understanding is what the scripture says. So I think peace is one of the greatest ways. Once you experience the supernatural peace of God, it is so different from what the world calls peace, just where you don't have a problem at the moment, and so you're calling it peace. But once you experience this, this is one of the easiest ways to discern the voice of God, is what do you have peace about? So I've said all of these things that I've said tonight specifically to aid you. We've been talking about Karis Bible College and encouraging you to come, and I tell you again, I make no apologies for it. I've seen the fruit of it. It's like, you know, if I had a cure right now for any person who's got the COVID vaccine, and if I had it and I said, well, I'm not going to tell people about it because they might think I'm pushing this on them. They may not like this. They, you couldn't do that. If you had a guaranteed cure for every person, I guarantee you, you'd be blabbing it to every person. You'd try and get every single person to experience it. And we have a cure for what ails you. It's right here. This isn't the only place, but I guarantee you, it is working here. And we've been trying to encourage you to come. And so I've said all these things tonight to help you discern 
the voice of God. You know, you need to sit down and just like I did, forget about whether you're going to lose money. I had to deal with that when I made the decision to drop out of secular university. I had to make the decision, what are people going to think about me? And I had to make a decision. You know, Romans chapter 3, verse 4 says, let God be true and every man a liar. I had to make a decision if it cost me my life, if I die because of this decision, what do I have peace about? And I didn't have total peace, but you know what? I had more peace about following the desires that were in my heart than I did about just trying to be accepted to people, following their decisions and things like this. And I have never regretted it. I've never regretted any good thing that God has ever done in my life. It started with that decision. And man, it has just put me on a road that I'd have had to backslide on God to keep from doing what I'm doing. And so I say to you, you know, do you have the desire? You need to sit down and think of and, for, and forget about how are you going to pay for it? Jesse Duplantis is a friend of mine, and he said one of the things that set him free was God told him to do something, and he was saying, God, how am I going to pay for this? And God spoke to him, and he said, I didn't ask you to pay for it. I asked you to believe for it. There's a difference. It's not your responsibility to pay for it. Now, God will use you, but he will speak to you. You forget right now about the money. Forget about what other people say. And there's a lot of you that if you, I've had people come up and say, if I could just do what I wanted to, I'd be there. But then they talk about family members. They talk about finances. They talk about job. They talk about retirement. They talk about, you know, all of these other things. Right now, just push all those things out of your mind. What is it that you want to do? Are you delighting yourself in the Lord? I believe that you are. If you've joined us for these uh, meetings, you're putting God first. You could be watching as the stomach turns on television, but you're here watching me. You have a desire for the things of God. And do you have a desire to come and be a part of this? And don't say, but what about all of this? Let me give you one last thing before I quit right here, that this is something that really touched me, that God told Abraham to leave his father and, and mother and his brothers, brethren, his father's house and go out into a land that he would later show him. Abraham didn't completely obey. He only came out partially and lived with his father for a period of time. Then when his father died, he still didn't completely obey. He brought his nephew with him because his brother was dead. And I'm sure he felt some kind of responsibility to his nephew to provide for him and protect him in his brother's uh, stead. And so he brought Lot with him, I'm sure with good motive, thinking I'm doing the right thing, but it wasn't what God told him. God told him to leave all of his father's house. And I'm sure he was thinking, but what would happen to Lot? Let me ask you, how could it have been any worse for Lot than what it turned out to be? Because he drug Lot with him, Lot went down to Sodom and Gomorrah and the angels destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. He lost two daughters at least because it says he went to his sons-in-law, plural, in the city and tried to talk them into coming with him and they wouldn't come. So that was at least two daughters, two sons-in-laws and possibly grandchildren. And then he brought his two daughters that were still at home with him and they wound up getting him drunk and committing incest and were cursed by God. And his wife turned around and looked behind her and turned into a pillar of salt. So he lost basically four daughters, no telling how many grandchildren. His wife was turned into a pillar of salt. He lost everything. How could it have been any worse if Abraham would have just obeyed God and left Lot in Ur of the Chaldees? And I say that to you, that there are some of you that but these people are depending upon me and I can't do this. I'm not saying that you don't love family members. I'm not saying that you don't try and do the right thing. But if God is speaking to you to come, you just do it. And you let the chips fall where they may. And I guarantee you, you will be better off and so will they. They may not tell you that. They may get very mad at you. I had people get mad at me. I had family members hate me 
because of the decision that I made. But did you know every single one of them before they died turned around and admitted that God had led me and they could see that it was God and they repented and God restored the relationship. Really, it just comes down to what Wendell said this morning. Whatever God says to you, do it. And one of the ways he speaks to you is through just what's in your heart. What's your desire? Are you like those lepers sitting at the gate and you're saying, how long are we going to sit here till we die? You aren't fulfilled. You know there's something more. Are you just going to be in this same place next year? Are you going to be coming to campus days next year and going through this same thing? Whatever God has said to you, I want to encourage you to do it. Man, that'll change your life. I believe that God is speaking to a lot of people. You know, I don't know how many people we've had sign up. I saw something, I think it was this morning or last night, that we'd had 27 people uh, sign up. I don't know how many, but there ought to be hundreds. We had 2,600 people watching in last uh, yesterday. There ought to be hundreds of you that God is speaking to. And I'm just encouraging you, don't, don't let it go. God's not going to force you. Did you know what? God will not badger you. He's a gentleman. If I hadn't have made those decisions that I've made, did you know God still would have loved me? But I am convinced that that experience that I had March the 23rd, 1968, it wouldn't still be the same to me as it is today. It's stronger in my life today than it was back then because I've been following the leadership of what he told me to do. But when you start saying no to the Lord, for whatever reason, whether you think they're good reasons or not, God is not going to sit there and just badger you. That is not the way that he is. He will draw you. He will woo you, but he will not force you. So I want to pray for you right now. If God's speaking to you, I want you to respond. This is life and death. There are some of you that if you don't respond, you know what? You, you could be having Satan come at you with sickness. You could have something else happen. He could literally, there, there is supernatural protection when you're doing what God tells you to do, but you get out from under that and you make yourself vulnerable. This is a life and death decision. I really believe that. So Father, I pray for all the people watching right now, and I know that you're speaking to people, and I know that you're no respecter of persons. The same thing that you've done for me and that you've done for every one of the speakers that has been talking Father, I know that you have a plan for every person and that you are speaking to people. And I know that Karis Bible College is your part of your plan for hundreds of people right now. So, Father, I'm praying for them that they would respond to the Holy Spirit that is touching their heart right now. And I know some of them, this is an emotional decision. It could cost them a lot of things. There could be potential damage. But Father, we believe your plans for us are better than our plans for us. We stand on that scripture in Jeremiah 29, 11, that I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end, a hope and a future. Father, I pray right now that your Holy Spirit would just draw people and give them the courage, the boldness to get out of the boat and start walking in a miracle. Father, to begin this process. And Father, for those that are so uh, stressed out about this that they aren't 100% sure, then just like you told me, I ask that you would help them to just put some motion to their boat, to start moving in this direction and see whether their peace increases or decreases. Father, I pray that you would help people to take a step of faith right now. Draw them, Father. We only want the ones that you want, but those that you are speaking to, I believe that the Holy Spirit is just convicting them that they know it. There are some of you right now that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt what God's telling you to do and you're just hesitant to do it. Man, you need to get beyond that. God's plans for you are better than your plans for yourself. I'm encouraging you that you need to do it. You need to step out. 
You know, we got people on our phones right now that you can call in. They can pray with you and help you. They could also help you register for school. Is that correct? Yes. They're, they're equipped to help you register for school. If you don't know what to do, where to go, they can help you. I think that we're making the registration uh, free. Is that yes. So you could register now. I think it's a $100 registration fee, and we're waiving that just to help you. But you know what? When you make that commitment and go ahead and register... That's going to that's gonna start putting some motion to your boat. You're taking a step, and I guarantee you the Holy Spirit will bear witness with it. But you've got to step out. You've got to begin to start moving in that direction. And praise God, I believe if you do it, you'll, you'll never regret it. I can't guarantee you you won't have any problems. Man, I've had a few problems since I've made that decision, but I certainly don't regret this. And I can guarantee you when we get to heaven, some of you that are feeling like right now, I'm leaning on you, I'm twisting your arm. You're going to come up to me in heaven and you're going to hug me and kiss me and thank me for doing it because you wouldn't have done it otherwise. I am encouraging you and I encourage you to step out and take a step. Amen. Praise God. If you'll do that, you'll never regret it. And you know what? You've got other people's miracles. You've got potential on the inside of you that you've not yet seen. And if you don't develop them, not only are you going to suffer, but there's other people that won't hear the good news. They won't receive their miracle because you've got their miracle. So you need to do it for yourself and for other people. It'll bless you. Amen. So my part's over. I'm going to thank you for being a part of this. And I'm going to turn it back over to Clay. And I think you're going to give away. Yes. A scholarship. So praise God. Thank you for being a part of this. And if God spoke to you, whatever he said to you, do it. Amen. Praise God. For more of Andrew's teaching and other resources, please visit our website at awmi.net. Or for prayer and additional information, call our helpline at 719-635-1111. Again, that's 719 719- 635 1111.
Stay 
great before I can say proudly That I love you and your love is great You are such an amazing man I have seen love before But I never felt that great before I can say proudly That I love you and your love is great You are such an amazing man You have awakened a part of me You have created something I never knew You not only care about me But you always respect me as I You are such an amazing man I have seen love before But I never felt that great before I can say proudly That I love you and such an amazing man I have seen love before But I never felt that great before I can say proudly That I love you and your love is great You are such an amazing man You have awakened a part of me you have created something I've never knew You not only care about me But you always respect me as I am You have accepted a part of me And that makes all the difference to me You are so You have